Are you tired of debt collectors? Are you tired of the credit bills? Are you tired of everybody violating your rights? Guess what? We got a lawyer. We heard you. So we're going to bring them to answer your specific questions so you too can knock the credit bills out and beat those debt collectors for violating your right. So let's get into it. Without further ado, we have Mr. Aaron all the way from Florida coming live to you to help you and guide you whatever specific questions you're asking. And if you're, if you're on replay and you're watching this, put your questions in the chat because we're going to take them and ask them so we can help you and get the things that you need off your credit report. All right. All right. Hold on. Let me let me let me cook for, for a minute. Hey, look, if you find this valuable, share it to at least five people because Aaron, he ain't going to come all the time. But behind the scenes, we are hearing people saying a lot of things about debt collectors, the FCRA and how to get remedy. But now we actually get to talk to the lawyer to a lawyer. And most people don't want to bring a lawyer on their platform because they probably not even telling y'all the right thing. So y'all know me and Dave love y'all to death. So we definitely want to give y'all the most relevant and the best information possible. And without further ado, let me bring up Aaron so he can talk to you guys and answer a bunch of your questions. Hi, everyone. My name is attorney Aaron Swift. As the guy said, I'm down here in Florida. Um, brief introduction before we get to the questions, just to set the table. So I own uh, two law firms. Our flagship is down in St. Pete, Tampa area in Florida. And we just launched a national firm called Swift Law North, and that's based out of D.C. And with partners like these great guys, Mike and Dave, are some of our flagship partners with this new venture. We are building a nationwide network of attorneys that we're helping to connect you all, the consumers, with attorneys in your home states that can sue these debt collectors, credit reporting agencies, credit card companies, background check companies, landlords, uh, repo agents, all of them. You, you name a company that's in the financial sector, we want to sue them because they all break the law and you all don't even understand the power of what I can do for you and how important it is. So also before we get to the questions, I want to thank Mike and Dave. They're incredible at what they do. You guys have come to the right place, the right platform, and through their help, connecting to us and then connecting you to lawyers across the country. We're going to do three main things. That's keep this in mind. Number one, we're going to fix the problem. That's always the number one goal. We want to stop debt collection harassment. We want to fix your credit reports. We want to clean up identity theft problems. We want to get old inquiries that shouldn't be there off. Everything you can possibly imagine. That's number one. Number two, I want to put money in your pocket. This whole program is built upon fixing the problem, but then compensating you for it. These companies make more money than they know what to do with. We're talking billion dollar profit margins every year with a B. We want a piece of that pie because we deserve it. So number two is we want to put money in your pocket for these problems. It could be $1,000. It could be $100,000 or more, depending on the type of case. And then number three, the bad guys have to pay me. That's what's so important to know. No one in our program, absent very similar or small circumstances, ever come out of pocket to pay me. If I am suing someone on your behalf, a debt collector, a credit reporting agency, you know, a background company, you don't pay me. Nothing out of pocket. We take it on a contingency fee basis, which means we only get paid if we win. So number one, we fix the problem. Number two, we're going to put money in your pocket. Maybe forgive the debt if it's legitimate, get rid of it if it's not. And number three, the bad guys pay me so that you don't have to. So thanks. Excited about these questions and uh, let's get started. Ooh, we're about to permanently remove some debt. Man, it's about to be dope. So um, first things first, we have Miss Lisa. She's a 700 plus Blueprint member and she is being sued and she wants some specific help. Not okay. Totally. And let me also, let's set the stage for how we do this. Yeah. If you're going to ask me a specific question, I need to know your name and your state. That's the, mm -hmm. the initial information, because if you're in Florida, I can give very specific legal advice. If you're not in Florida, I'm going to give advice, but it's going to be more of a general nature. So that's, I just need your name and then the state you're in. So. All right. Are you hey, ready? Lisa? Yep. I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. So I'm 
My name is Lisa Gassett. I, I live in, uh, in Texas. Okay. I just recently moved here three years ago. My debt was from when I was living in California from um, Credit One Bank, but LVNV Funding now owns it. And so it was almost the four year mark. It's almost the four year mark, I think in like March, actually when we go to court. Um, so one day I just opened my door and there's a lady there serving me for my credit one credit card from LVN funding. I responded to my um, deal at the courts. I, I was told that you're supposed to kind of fight back on it, ask for more validation that they own my, if they really own my debt. Cause in the paperwork they gave me, it only shows that they bought a bunch of it says accounts. And then also just a statement of what the credit card was spent on. Right, right. So um, I asked for more um, information, more validation, um, a binding contract being between both parties. Is the court supposed to send me something back to a response or is that the only response I get was when I go to court? Well, that's a great question. Um, so first, quick disclaimer, since you're not in Florida, I'm going to give general advice that you okay. find applicable and helpful. Okay. Um, and Lisa, this also gives me an opportunity to talk more generally about these types of lawsuits, because I think it okay. can apply to other people here watching live today. Um, okay. It happens a lot and a lot of people in this space. So what you're describing is what's called a, a debt buyer situation, or we call them junk debt buyers. Right. LVNV is one of such companies, a huge one. LVNV is owned by a parent company called Resurgent Capital, and they're a billion dollar corporation. So think about that. They're spending enough money to buy old debt such that then when they collect it, they're bringing in a billion dollars a year of revenue with a B. Right. There are others you may have heard of, like uh, Midland Credit is another big one, um, MCM. Um, but those are all junk debt buyers, or they buy what, what's called portfolios of accounts. So, Lisa, you, you mentioned a couple of very important things I want to talk about here with these types of cases. So, number one, if it's a first party creditor suing you, it's always a lot more difficult. Okay. So, you're in a better position than some consumers because you have a debt buyer. Right. And so that means at least one time there was allegedly a change of ownership of your debt. You did mention it was credit one originally. Right. But what's crazy, even though it went from credit one to LVNV, I can almost guarantee there's three or four more steps behind the scenes. And the hard part for these companies is they have to prove every one of those steps. So what you described as, you know, the documents you're getting back, there's some other things that you're going to want. Um, one is called a forward flow agreement. A forward flow agreement is what's basically the master contract that's between LVNV and Credit One Bank. Credit okay. One Bank probably sold 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 accounts along with yours at one yeah. time, one that's batch. What... I'm sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, that's what it looks like when it says they bought accounts. It just says, that sounds like a bunch of them. Right, right. And yours is one of them. So okay. sometimes it's like a needle in a haystack. And if you're doing the right thing by fighting back, these things can be won very easily if they're junk okay. accounts. Um, and Lisa, what I'd like to do is and connect with Mike and Dave after the program, because again, this whole program is about connecting you all to lawyers. If it's me, amazing. I love it to be. We have coverage in many states, or it's going to be one of my. Um, you know, amazing partners. And I've got great partners in Texas. So um, awesome. rest assured, there are good defenses to these cases. Um, you know, like I said, they have to prove the change of ownership the whole way through. There are okay. specific types of documents that you're going to want to either get or ask for. And okay. then another important thing about these junk debt buyer cases is let's talk numbers. Lisa, I don't want you to tell me any specifics because it's private, but I'm just, let's just say they're suing you for $5,000 or anyone, anyone's being sued for $5,000. You had a $5,000 debt for credit one, credit one bank, and now it's with LVNV. 
from my past experience, and I've been doing this going on 14 years, I've seen thousands of these contracts. They pay between three and 12% of the original amount to buy your debt. Think of that, three and 12%. And it depends on how old the debt is or- It's almost year. four years. Originally the credit card was like $400 and now it's up to 832. Which makes sense because of all the, the interest and late fees and other things that accrue. Um, so, so $400 to 800, they probably paid less than $80 for that account. Yeah. So what that means is it gives you some leverage to negotiate. And junk debt buyers are always willing to take less than the full amount. In my experience, sometimes they'll take low as like 30% of the debt. Now, on one hand, they look like Santa Claus. Hey, we're giving you a 70% discount. We're, we're the greatest people on earth. Well, <laughs> part of my language, but screw you. You paid 3% and now you're charging me 30%. You're going to be on your yacht with that markup. Right. Okay? So, so it gives you a lot of leverage. And these types of cases, again, it's very important to understand. Okay. Try to fight back. They don't I, want you to fight back. And, and Lisa, let me real quick. And I'm going to ask you <laughs> another thing. Specific, but just generally speaking, you're doing the right thing because all they want to do is to get you to default. They don't want you to show up to court. They don't want you to fight back. They don't want you to answer because all they want is a default. Then they get everything they're asking for plus more and they get to garnish either your paycheck or your tax return. So just fighting back is always a good thing. It gives you additional leverage. So Lisa, you're, you're doing the right thing by that. And sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I was also asking too, because I also, even though I was served, I don't know if this is valid to do it after you've been served, but I also sent them another letter of validation and they still send me the same thing, the statement through the resurgent and then the, the um, statement of what I spent, you spent on, on your bill and stuff. They right. still sent me that. Then later on, I end up sending a deceased and cis letter and they responded to that. Is that considered still a violation or not if I've that's been a, served already? That's a great question. So being served doesn't stop many things. It doesn't stop their right to keep collecting from you. They can still call. They can still send you things um, up until sending a cease and desist, for example, like like you just described. But being being served and being sued doesn't really stop many other clocks um, or timelines. The one it does stop is the statute of limitations. Um, so as you mentioned, the debt was originally from California, so it's four years. So it does sound like they sued you. They don't have to get their judgment by four years. All they have to have done is filed their lawsuit within four years. Okay. And it sounds like they have done that. Yes. So that's, that would be a successful defense that it's past the statute of limitations, but there are plenty of other options in the toolbox to, to try to defeat them. And let me also say, Lisa, that if, if you don't defeat them, another strategy is to get onto the lowest settlement that you can, because one of the things that I love to do is sue these idiots on the back end. Yeah. So these companies get so greedy and lazy that once you enter into an agreement with them, like everything else goes out the window. And what yeah. they all do will credit report erroneous information after the settlement. So in a situation like yours, let's just say, for example, that you negotiate a $400 settlement paid over 10 months. You know, you pay okay. $40 a month for 10 months. That might be something they would absolutely, you know, you should offer that. I would recommend they might. Take okay. But guess what? So you're going to pay for 10 months, the $40 a month. And then I'm going to say to you, hey, Lisa, I want to talk to you in month 11 or month 12, because we're going to check your credit reports. And I can almost guarantee you they're still going to report that you owed the $800. They're not going to be showing your settlement mm -hmm. payment, not reducing your balance. So mm -hmm. even if we defeat them right away in the defensive uh -huh. case, we might be able to go after them in the long run. So that's a really oh. fun strategy. And we, we, we do that all the time. So, that's but Lisa, awesome. Any more specifics, I would say let's connect you with a okay. Texas attorney. Um, but it was a great first question because we got to talk a lot about a lot of things, the junk debt buying industry, some strategies to use and um, defending. But, but let me also say something very important for, for Lisa and everyone else. Remember when I talked about there's some small circumstances where you do have to pay the attorney. 
when they are defending you, it's often that case. So if you're being sued by a landlord for eviction, if you're being sued for an old credit card debt, or you're being sued for foreclosure, you do have to pay the attorney's fees because it's not like the offensive cases where the bad guys get to pay us per the statute. Now we're incredibly reasonable. You know, we understand you're in this position, um, but there is always a little bit of skin in the game. And we try to get that back for you anyway, like I said, in the long run. But just so, keep in mind, if, if someone's being sued, it doesn't mean that someone's going to represent you for free. Sometimes they will if it's egregious enough. Like, for example, if a case comes to me past the statute of limitations, I don't charge my clients anything because I, I know I'm going to win it and then they're going to have to pay me because I'm going to sue them under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act because they sued someone past the statute of limitations. That's a violation. So anyway. So is it best I offer a letter of settlement before or do I, when I show up to court, then offer to do like the 400 for the $40 a month? That's a great question. And, and I'm so glad you asked it. You should offer that soon because okay. the longer it goes and the closer it gets to court, they're going to have to put some time and resources into it. Okay. And they're going to be less likely to take a lower amount. So okay. kind of strike while the iron's hot and early. Um, so just and another simple. important thing for Lisa and everyone else if you ever negotiate a settlement, whether that's because you've been sued or not, you just settle a debt with a debt collector, always get it in writing. They will try not to. They don't like to put these in writing because that gives you a lot of proof and leverage, but always get a settlement in writing, whether that's you're settling a, a lawsuit or you're settling a debt with a debt collector on the phone or, or via email. So do I call in on that or do I send them a letter certified and this is what I could do? Call, call first. Okay. You know, you call. And then okay. if you do, you know, and, and another thing, let's talk about strategies here. Okay. Never started offering 50%. Okay. Always start offering like 10%. Okay. Because remember at 10%, they might either be breaking even or just making a little bit of money. They're never going to take 10%, but you just want to start lower. Okay. You know, then they're going to offer, oh, well, we'll knock off 10%. You're going to say, well, I, I can't pay 90%. I can pay 20%. And then maybe you somewhere in the middle. But that's why it's always better on the phone. You can have a couple of quick phone calls. Letters just take too long and, and they get right. Off. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your information. Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. We appreciate you calling in. Yes. Thank you so much. You guys oh, enjoy the rest of your guys' chat. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Hey, Aaron. Hey, Mike, ask, um, answer some questions first, and then we're gonna bring a few more, you know, next people. Okay, I was about to say, man, Aaron, that was that was very good, man. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Are awesome. No, I was saying, answer some people's question. No, the question you answered helped some people in the chat. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. All right, I got one right here. <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty sure it's kind of the same thing. Being sued by a debt collector, I responded to the courts. They told me to respond to the collection agency. Yeah, that's a great point. So it's very important to understand when you've been sued, there's now two separate processes taking place. There's the court case, which has deadlines. It has rules. It has uh, standard procedures. And then there's still the debt collection that can happen outside of court. When you say that you responded to the courts, Trish, what that's telling me is if then they told you to talk to the collection agency, it tells me that it wasn't an official proceeding yet. It wasn't the final hearing. Um, and what it probably means is that you were asking for certain information from them or wanting to settle it or, or discuss with them. The only time you'll use the courts is when there's a set hearing or a very set specific deadline. So again, it's two different processes. So if someone has sued you, it doesn't mean you can't be talking to them outside. In fact, courts encourage it when, and then require it like they did with you because the courts follow a very specific steps. You know, they, they, you file the case that has deadlines, they've got their calendars, you know, you go to these hearings and there's a hundred other parties waiting. So yeah, the courts want parties to always talk to each other unless it's a very specific court event. And that's to encourage settlement and to skirt, you know, finding ways to move forward, um, putting obstacles aside to resolve the case. So that, that's why you're being told to talk to the collection agency. The only time you'll go through the courts is a, a specific court event, like a hearing or a, a deposition or something like that. Okay. I'm um, going to have one right here. Um, do you have partners in PA? Red. I am. I grew up in Pennsylvania. Uh, I 
I'm an Eagles fan. Although the last two weeks haven't made me happy. I've got a lot of partners in Pennsylvania. My family's still there. I'm going to be up in Pennsylvania here, here in a couple of weeks. So I've got lots of them. Um, Pennsylvania is a, you know, a great place for me. Like I said, grandma, brothers, all up there. So Pennsylvania is a great state. And mind you, and I was talking to Mike and Dave before we all jumped on, the goal of this program is to help every single state. Now, if someone here is from North Dakota, I can't promise I have a good partner in North Dakota lined up just yet. But big states, states with a lot of population, we have partners everywhere. All right, great. great. Including outside Philly. Oh, okay. All right, Dave, yeah, can we bring up the from. Okay. Can we bring up the next guest, Dave? Or do you want me to ask ask another question? Oh, there she go. What's going on, Robin? Hi, I was trying to find me a charger because now my battery is dying, but um, we're gonna try to get through it. Oh, hi, Rob. It's Robin. Hi. Hi, yeah, I see you talking about my Eagles. <laughs> That's right. That's okay. That's okay. We have Monday night coming up, so. Yeah, they flexed it. Seahawks. We going, we going so are you are you in Pennsylvania, Robin? I am. I'm right outside of Philadelphia. I'm in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. And so Excellent. like, you know, if I go up the street and around the corner, I'm in Philadelphia. Yeah, I grew up outside of Harrisburg in the Carlisle oh. area. Okay. Okay. Well then we friends then. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Dave and Mike, for um allowing me to be on. Thank you, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Um like I said, I hope my my battery doesn't die. Um, but so I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, I've been in this credit space now almost this coming March will be two years. Um, I began last year uh, just wanting to fix my own credit. Mm -hmm. um, I joined one of those credit groups in on Facebook, and I heard them say, look up Dave Cousins. And so I did that, and then I started following Dave, and I started doing a lot of things that, you know, he put in his content, and a lot of it, you know, like, worked, like, a lot of it. And so um, now I'm basically, well, first of all, I'm, I've cleaned up everything. I've cleaned up everything. I have one thing left on my report that I'm trying to get off. And I just want to know, I mean, because I'm not the one to say to take no for an answer. <laughs> so, you know, when they say verify, okay, prove it to me. But I just want to know if I'm using the information the right way or if I'm using it in the right contents. So, from what my understanding is that you can get anything deleted from your credit report, including open accounts. Um, I have a car note and I don't want it on my credit report. And so I've sent them like three letters asking them to remove the account from my credit report. And so I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not going to pay. I'm just saying that I don't want the account reported. And so I based it off of um, the Graham Leach Bailey Act. And um, as far as them giving me my disclosures letting me know or giving me the opportunity to opt out of this information being reported. So I put that in the letters to them. And each time they sent the response back saying, we are reporting this account correctly and it's going to continue to report. And so now, um, so I want to know, A, did I use the right information when I sent them the letter? And B, can this be deleted from my credit report? Well, <clears throat> Robin, you bring up some really important points that we're about to talk about. So, number one, anything can be deleted. Okay. Because I'm going to explain to you what the dispute process actually looks like behind the scenes. 
That's the okay. good news. Okay. The bad news is, no, you don't have a proper basis to get that deleted. That, that okay. act doesn't say that. And more importantly, your contract with your car note company requires credit reporting. And unless okay. they report inaccurate, incomplete, inaccurate or incomplete information about that account, there's nothing we're going to be able to do legitimately based on the law. But let me explain how when I say that anything can be removed, because okay. when I describe to you all what actually happens behind the scenes when you dispute something, it's going to make you fall out of your chair. Okay. So let me let me give a real quick 10,000 foot view of what it means when you dispute. Okay. So there's four to five primary methods that you can dispute right now. You can send a letter. You can do it on the phone. You can send a fax. You can do it through the CFPB. Mm -hmm. And you can also do it through the FTC in certain circumstances. Okay. So I send a letter, a phone call, fax, something to these bureaus. Let me explain this process. So I can send a 20-page letter and they're still going to distill it down to three characters. I can send a, a six minute voice, you know, conversation about what's going on. Every dispute is categorized by these companies down to three characters. It's usually a letter and then two digits, two numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's supposed to tell what your dispute is about. Right. And so what happens is all your information gets down to those three characters. And that's done by a computer. Right now it's done by a lot of AI. Mm -hmm. before they were sending stuff overseas and they still do that, which I'm going to explain. So you, you start a dispute. You say, you say, Hey, I don't have, um, I don't want this on my credit report. You know, I, I don't give you permission. I'm opting out. And again, I don't, that's not what this, that statute says, but nonetheless, a computer read that information and took it down to a letter and two digits. And then it sh ships that three digit code to the computer that's furnishing the information. That's the, the debt collector or the car note company. And all it does, its computer looks at those same three pieces of information and says, oh no, yeah, we're reporting, right? And shoots an information, uh, just an information signal back that says, okay, verify. And usually that's just one digit, like a one or a two or three. There's seldom any human involvement. There's no, concerning review of the information, it's almost always automated. So that's the reason why real disputes that have real validity, if there's an ID theft issue or past statute limitations or you settled an account, that's why they verify everything is because it's almost always just one computer talking to another. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I ultimately said it can be deleted is because those systems get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And when the computer queues fill up, it does get sent to live agents in the Philippines or in India and, and some other countries, but they're all overseas. And that's only when there's an overflow. Those people make mistakes. They might look at a letter and say, hey, that looks impressive. She cited a statute and just hit the delete button because they're getting paid 37 cents an hour and they don't care. So... That's why I started by saying everything can be deleted because depending on the person or the computer or the, the process that's going to determine who is actually doing the quote investigation. And the, this is the funny part. The law says you have to perform a reasonable investigation. Right. Well, how is that reasonable when it's just one computer talking to another about three digits? Um, so Great, great question, Rob, and allowed me to kind of talk about the dispute process. It is set up to fail. It's why I have a job, because if all the disputes worked, I couldn't sue them. Um, but yeah, the system is set up to just agree with the original reporter. And, and let's talk about why. Do you know how Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, they make their money? Do, do you well, have they, you um, I, I believe I know how. Yeah, they they make their money because companies pay them to report the information. Amen. Robin, you it's like we set that up before tonight. <laughs> That's exactly right. They make a little bit of money when you pay them for those monitoring products that you should never do, by the way. Never, ever. But we can talk about that in a minute, but never okay. enter an agreement with these companies because they're going to make you arbitrate. They're going to sneak fine print against you. That's going to 
take rights away from you. But yeah, they make their money, the billions of dollars, because Capital One is paying them 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year. Every time Capital One sends them information about you, they have to pay them a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. So who are they going to agree with? If you reach out to them and say, I'm right, Capital One's wrong, but Capital One is paying them 10 million dollars a year. Are they going to agree with you? Or are they going to agree with their partner? So the system's set up to fail. It's why like lawyers like me are so important to get connected to people like you and consumers and other, you know, people like Dave and Mike, because the system set up to fail. And as a consumer, you're going against billion dollar corporations who hire thousand dollar an hour lawyers who have glass mansion firms in the biggest cities in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's David versus Goliath. Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't make their money from me or you, they make their money from the company. So of course they agree with them. Right. Set up a fail. So, Okay, 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 okay. So I'm trying to like get my other question in before my battery because I'm literally on red. Right. Um, okay, so with with that being said, right? So Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. What about check systems? So check systems, um, I know they're a, a specialty, you right. know, credit reporting agency. And so to get out of check systems um you go through the dispute process and so what if you've disputed and they send you a copy of the contract from the bank but the the account is um charged off great question so how do you get that off so it's, it kind of goes back to my previous answer. It depends on the nature of what they're reporting. So you brought up a really good point. So everyone knows about the big three credit reporting agencies, you know, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. They're the ones that everyone's most familiar with. But what might shock you is there's over 250 credit reporting agencies. Mm -hmm. I know that. And actually, there's significantly more, depending on how you want to look at it. But there's credit reporting agencies about whether you've ever slipped and fall in a, in a supermarket and sued someone, you know, every insurance claim that you make, there's a, a credit report about you. Mm -hmm. Every checking account, savings account, those are called demand deposit accounts. Mm -hmm. There are credit reports about you and check systems is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so think of check systems, just like the big three Experian, Equifax and TransUnion. When you open your account with your bank, all that fine print gave them the right contractually to report to check systems or to anyone they want to, frankly. Okay. And the law says as long as they report accurately and completely, there's nothing we can do about it. So if the information they're reporting to check systems is accurate and complete, other than the description I gave earlier, when someone gets overworked or it slips through the cracks, you confuse them enough that you're dispute looks legitimate and then someone deletes it. Um, it just goes back to the law says they're allowed to report as long as there's a basis for them to. And that basis is always going to be some contract, generally speaking, or you, you know, fall behind in debt, you know, like a medical debt doesn't necessarily have a contract, but the law also says in order to debt collect, they can use a credit report. So that's how you get collections on the credit reports. So there's no contract necessarily, but the law allows them to do that. So the basis of any any type of dispute, whether it's check systems, a fishing license credit report, which exists, by the way, if you've ever overfished a lake and taken too many, you know, you take eight bass when you're only allowed to take six, there's a credit report that says this person, if they ever want to get a fishing license in your state, you may not want to give them that. So, um, but no matter what, background checks, your big three credit reports, I saw someone put in the, the chat here, LexisNexis, they are a massive credit reporting agency, um, mm -hmm. particularly about insurance mostly. But any of these, the basis to dispute has to be the information is inaccurate, incomplete, or too old and can't be reported. Unless it's one of those three things, you got to get lucky. Okay. 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 And one more, one more. Early warnings. That's the same is um, check system? It is. Yep. Okay. They're a specialty demand deposit reporting agency. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay. And okay. So 
inaccurate, incomplete. Or, or, or too old, you know, so if it's over seven years for bad information, 10 years for a bankruptcy, that, that would be the third reason why. Okay. Thank okay. Chris. Well, Robin thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate thank you, you. Robert. Thank you, Dave and Mike. All right. You're welcome. Good questions, Robin. All right. <clears throat> hey, Dave, I'm going to uh, run through some more of these questions. Aaron, are you good? Hey, I'm good. This is great. Hey, I'm excited. Hey, hey, Mike, ask one of them questions out of the documents because you know. Oh, I'm still I forgot. All right. Hey, Robin, you sticking around with us? You know what? I'm going to, I'm making some collard greens for a company um, uh, potluck tomorrow. So I'm going to check on my collard greens, but I'll be okay. right back. Uh, but I'm still going to listen in, but you can take my face off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, uh, Aaron. So a question is, um, if a client got their student loan forgiven um, by Biden's plan, but the company still put a 30 day late on a credit report, is that a violation of the FCRA? Maybe. And that's a famous lawyer answer, or it depends. That's a real famous one is, is responding. It depends. It depends on when the late occurred. So if the late occurred prior to the settlement or prior to when it was forgiven, it sucks, but they can go back and put bad information in the past. In If they put a missed payment or late payment after it was forgiven, well, that's of course wrong because you can't owe a payment and then miss a payment after it has been forgiven. So it is, and I hate this rule because a lot of companies will do this after you resolve with them, you know, you settle it or they forgive it. They do a final like accounting, you know, on their side. And sometimes that adds information to your credit report because that final accounting is a final summary of the whole account. And so if you missed a payment four years ago, it may only pop up now when you finally close it, because they do a final review and they submit the final round of information back. So it could be the case that this person had their student loan forgiven, that student loan company did the final reconciliation of that account, and that made an old missed payment pop up. Unfortunately, if it's within seven years and that payment was legitimately missed, there's nothing we can really do about that. But if they forgive a debt and then mark you late afterwards, that's of course wrong. We do that case all the time. You know, we, we talked earlier with Lisa. If, you know, you settle with an account, they can't mark you late for the next owed payment. But that happens, too. So really, it depends. So we just need to know a little bit more about that particular question. If it was a legitimate missed 30, 60, 90, all the way up to 180 in the past, it's accurate. There's not much we can do unless it's older than seven years or they mark you late after they forgive it. That's a big uh, problem. Okay. Yeah, I think this guy said uh, he was in forbearance and they still marked him late. So that's different. That's a good, that could be a good case. So when you're in forbearance, you don't owe money. That's what a forbearance agreement is. So if we can prove in writing the period of that forbearance, we might better help with that case. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, and that's a good segue to the next question. Dave, you got something before I ask? <clears throat> okay. Um, somebody asked, um, what are some ways that we can prove our violations? Okay. So glad you asked that question. And it's going to be a, a good thing for me to talk about generally. One important thing to understand is there is a big difference between what a lawyer can do in litigation and what is successful in credit reporting and credit disputing world and credit repair. So in a court of law, which we're gonna be suing and mostly federal court, we have to prove ironclad. So I'm so glad that question got asked, which means don't throw away any mail. You know, if we're working with you, don't throw away mail from debt collectors, don't throw away mail from creditors, landlords, what have you. The credit reporting agencies, if you get mail from them, because by the way, if you hire an attorney or hire a credit repair you know, group and they dispute for you, the law still says the results come back to the consumer directly. So even though I may send a letter on a consumer's behalf, the consumer is going to get the results. So the best way to prove these violations is to always keep the evidence. Let's talk about other types of violations, right? So let's say it's a phone call and a debt collector is rude and aggressive and makes threats or swears at you. Well, two things. One is 
that call is going to be recorded on their end. I can guarantee it. The other thing is in your state, which check your state, you may have the right to record them. For example, in Florida, Florida is what's called a two-way recording state. So I can't record someone unless they I tell them. But everyone knows you get that phone call and it says, this call may be monitored for quality assurance or you know training purposes. That is a notice to you that they may record. So you automatically have the right to record in the state of Florida. You don't even have to ask or tell them because they have already told you, hey, I might be recording you. You can record them. Um, so that's another important thing. Don't throw out mail. You know, don't delete voicemails. Don't delete your call history, you know, in your call log, because if we're going to sue debt collectors, we have to prove what they did. You know, we either need the letter that they shouldn't have sent you, um, you know, that phone call that's going to be recorded. If someone's rude to you on the phone, just take notes, you know, and write a little date next to it. Because in the court, if I say, hey, my client took contemporaneous handwritten notes, you can see it on this notepad. It's dated that day at the same time as the phone call. Who are they going to believe? They're going to believe the consumer with these notes or are they going to believe the debt collector saying, oh, I never. I never yeah. thought that. Oh, and by the way, we, we lost the, the phone recording somehow, which always happens. <laughs> but how we prove these things is through evidence. And that evidence is don't throw anything out. Keep notes. You know, don't delete voicemails, um, especially the mail. And then prove the violations for the credit reporting. That really depends on the nature of the dispute. You know, if you're saying I didn't pay late and they marked me late, well, show me your clear check. Show me the payment that you submitted through the online portal on the 29th day. You know, sometimes these companies get greedy, right? You have 30 days to generally pay until they mark you late. Well, companies have been sued for sending, you send the payment on the 29th day. Well, guess what? It goes to the bottom of their pile. So by the time they get to, it's been 32 days. They can't do that, right? So we would have to prove, hey, I, I postmarked the payment this date and so on and so forth. But you know, if it's ID theft, we have to prove you didn't take out these loans. If it's I settled this account, we have to prove you paid that settlement. Um, the proof is always going to be in the pudding, but it's just keep the evidence. Don't throw anything out. Keep good notes. It will be golden. Great All question. Right. All right. Hey, um, hey, you guys, Um, because the lawyer is here, it's 180 people in here. Congratulations to you guys who are getting all this information. Uh, if you guys can kindly hit the like button, um, uh, it'll... Uh, share it to more people and then more people can grab this information. I do have one more question before we break up our next guest. Is that okay with right. you, Aaron? Absolutely. All right. All right. Um, all right. It says the credit, the credit collection that garnished my check reached out and now they're trying to get another account with, with garnishment, garnishment of my check. So I don't, I think that's like an open ended question kind of. I think what it's happening is someone's already been sued. Mm -hmm. Now their check's being garnished. Now that same agency picked up a second account and they're oh. coming after them for a second account. They're going to try to garnish more. I think that's what the question is asking. Um, oh, yeah, I think that is. So Sakina. Sakina. Yeah, Sakina, I see you in the comments section. You said, can I get my question answered, please? Will you write in that chat real quick if, if my summation was correct there? Do I have your question summarized correctly, Sakina? Oh, by the way, you guys, if you have a debt collector that's contacting you or texting you, um, hit me and Dave up on Instagram. I'm going to uh, bring it down on the bottom, and then we, we'll get on a call with you guys or put you on a call with our team so um, we can expedite your process so you can work with uh, Aaron and the team. Yeah, that's a great point. So uh, this whole new program is is perfect for anyone with a debt collector coming after them. Any collections, any collections accounts, we are going to be able to help with that. We've created this 15-step program. It's got a lot of tech built into it. And those are great cases. So, um, you know, I didn't hear from Sakina. So I, I guess let me just answer this very quickly. Garnishment has very specific rules about how much of your disposable income can come out of every paycheck. So Sakina, the answer is going to be if you validly owe this second account, and if they get another judgment against you, it's going to be a simple calculation. And they're just going to say, all right, between these two accounts now, you're allowed to depending on the state, like in Florida, it's like 11% of your disposable income can be garnished. And there are other protections too, if you're head of household. So if you're the only, if you're the breadwinner or the only person making an income in a house, you can get protections against garnishment, but they can garnish as many accounts as you may owe if they get judgments against you, as long as the total amount of that garnishment is legal in that state, which is 
a, a factor of a percentage of your disposable income. Um, so that, that's probably the answer to that question. Oh, she said, yes, yes, indeed. Okay, perfect. I have a yeah, question. So they, people, they, they might be able to. How can, how can people protect themselves from this, like this stuff, like garnishments and... Yeah, great question. So the most important thing I can tell you is don't put your head in the sand because they can only garnish. Well, in most states, they can only garnish after they've sued you and won against you. There are very few states they can garnish. And some federal loans, like student loans, can be garnished right away that don't take lawsuits. But to protect is don't bury your head in the sand. These companies, they don't want to go to court against you. They don't, most of the time, it's not the first time you've ever heard from them. They, you know, they're sending you letters, they're calling you. One is if they're doing that, reach out to Mike and Dave first because we want to sue them. We don't want you to have to pay them. But to protect yourself, it's try to work out an arrangement with them. You know, if you don't actually owe it, if it's legitimately not your debt, of course, don't pay them. But if, if this is an old debt, if it's not past the statute of limitations, your best bet is to just negotiate the lowest amount you can as quickly as you can, because a garnishment's hard to stop. It's embarrassing. You know, it gets served on your employer. You don't have control over it, but they don't want it to get that far because then they have to pay an attorney to show up at court. They want to work with you um, because, again, if, if they take 40, 30, 45, 50 percent, they're still making 50 times what they paid for it sometimes. So they don't care. But to protect yourself, it's if you get to that stage, don't throw out anything, just work with them. The last thing you want is it to get to a judgment. It's so hard to unwind at that point. And this is the worst part. Judgments can be reported forever on your credit report in some states. So you can't even get them off. So you want to do everything you can to not get to a judgment is the simplest answer to that question, Dave. Okay. I have before my ask another question. So I always talk about like the consum consumer reports, the credit bureaus, which is Experience Trade Green and Equifax, has like incomplete, like it's inconsistent, like the open date, date last active, all that stuff is not reporting correctly. And people tell, I tell people to send a letter and tell them to update the information. I don't know or not, but most times they don't update it. Is that technically a violation? And can people technically serve? the credit bureaus for not? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, back when I was talking to Robin about the ways mm -hmm. you can dispute, it has to be inaccurate, incomplete, or too old generally. Well, if they're reporting inconsistently, it has to be one of them, at least one of them have to be inaccurate, right? So one of the things we love to do on the lawyer side and we absolutely litigate this i sue credit bureaus for this all the time and we serve them with federal lawsuits dave because they're reporting inconsistently if experian is reporting an open date of this month and transunion and equifax are reporting at something different we know for 100 percent certainty someone is reporting inaccurately because it can't both be true you know if it's different months same thing if they're reporting a different balance i don't care if a balance is off by one dollar on a different report someone has broken the law because they have reported inaccurate information. So inconsistent equals inaccurate always because something has to be wrong. And then what we do is we send a letter and we say, okay, Capital One, LVNB, whoever it is, here's what's being reported inconsistently between the, the bureaus, fix it. What that means is they, they have to either make them all match and that has to still be accurate or they have to delete it, but they almost always just verify. Absolutely, that's a great case. Love that case because it's so easy. I get to say, I mean, what are they going to do when I hold up two pieces of paper with different information? You know, you don't get to tell one story to one person and another story to another. So that's a great question. Inconsistency equals inaccuracy. Ooh, that's easy. And around. <laughs> Now, right, let me right. also give a small caveat, and this is something I want to make clear to everyone too. Not every piece of wrong information or inaccuracy will end up in litigation. There's still a, an analysis that has to go, go through what's called materiality. That's a legal term. It's always in cases. It's in a bunch of case law. What that means is it has to be important enough. You know, The open date, that's important because your open date will often determine how long something can be reported right? But, you know, if 
you know how they have those payment grids on some of the reports, you know, the, the 60 months, if it shows no data in one of those months, eh, probably not going to sue on that, you know, because there's 60 months there. And if it shows your on-time payments, otherwise, like that's wrong. You can dispute it. They should fix it. But if you come to me and say, Hey, Aaron, they're showing a no data on this one month of 60 and the other 59 are right. I'm going to say, you know what? That's annoying, but that's not worthy of a lawsuit. Um, but open date, they're, they're reporting the date of last payment differently. The date of last, you know, first delinquency differently, the, the last, you know, past due balance, any of the big indicators, like the big important things, how long something's going to be deleted. If there's inconsistency among any of that information, it equals inaccuracy equals lawsuit. Oh man, that's that's a layup, man. I, I see that a lot, actually. It, it is, and honestly, I I tell people this all the time. I could just practice with enough people if I just like set up a stand at a flea market outside the the grocery <laughs> store, because there was a, a special on forty um twenty minutes. What's yes, six, six. It was sixty minutes, and. 60 minutes. Uh, yeah, it was called a um, hundred million inaccuracies. Or something exactly, like hundred million inaccuracies, and and they they um, shared a stat that forty percent of people have material errors on their credit report, and that means material errors means it is something big enough that will impact your ability to get credit, a job, uh, an apartment. Forty percent of people. So that means there's hundred and eighty people on here, right? So that's sixty four people. You know. Probably right now, just on this Zoom, have or live YouTube, have errors that are material. So 40%. And I think that number is low because these companies since then, that's about 10 years old, that CBS um, oh, yeah. segment. In the last 10 years, these companies have started to embrace more technology and more artificial intelligence. And that's causing more inaccuracy. So I would say half or more. So literally, I could just set up outside the grocery store and say, hey, when's the last time you check your credit report? When's the last time you? And half the people are going to have problems. And I could just just practice my law that way. But, yeah. Oh, man. My, my biggest thing is they don't care. That's my. Who's the they in that sentence? The companies or the consumers or everyone? The, 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 the credit bureaus? They yeah, no, care. they don't care. Because they. here's another secret I'm going to tell you. They know they break the law and they don't care. because it is cheaper for them to pay me and to pay all the consumers that sue them across the company than it is to fix. And I know that for a fact because they run those numbers. They hired actuaries and they said, all right, for us, you know, a hundred million errors, right? A hundred million people in this country at that point had errors on their credit report. And they thought, all right, what would it take for us to get truly a hundred percent accurate? And the number was, it would be insane. They'd have to hire tens of thousands of people. Those people would have to spend an hour on each dispute. Guess how long a dispute agent spends on average on a dispute? Mike or Dave? How long? Like two uh, seconds? Less than a, a minute. Person? Less than or, a minute. Uh, oh. Mm -hmm. So the person, the computers, it's instantaneous. That, that, oh, yeah, there's yeah. no investigation. That's one computer saying to another. That takes a nanosecond. But even when they get to the overflow, so I send a 20-page letter and someone in the Philippines pulls that up, they're being timed. They're supposed to handle that in less than 60 seconds. How is that reasonable? It's not reasonable, but they don't care. Experience litigation budget every year is 30 to $60 million. That's what at the beginning of the year, when their board of directors get together and decide, all right, what money do we need to set aside for litigation this year? 30 to 60 million. That means they're willing, that means it's more expensive than 30 to 60 million than to fix the problem. And that's every year. Wow. So yeah, they don't care. They're making enough money. It's cheaper for them to, to settle these cases than it is to fix it. Man, that's amazing. All right. Uh, hey, Aaron, <clears throat> we're coming up on 55 minutes. Uh, you think we can get two more people in here for the live? And then yeah. we can like, make it like a five or 10 minute? Okay. I'm good. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know this person's name. What's... No. I'm going to add him to the stage. <laughs> I right. want to make up the name. How you doing? But um, my question is, I got a credit card company that Dominic, what state? I paid the what balance state? down to zero. State? South Carolina. State. South okay. Carolina. All right. I paid the balance down 
to zero. And then I lost the card. Well, I called them to tell them that I bought a house and that I lost the card and I needed to change my address. Well, they said no problem. They would change the address. They send me out a new card. Well, four months went by. I didn't hear anything. So I called them said, okay, they've changed the way they do business. I have to fax them something about, you know, a piece of mail, um, with a copy of my driver's license, you know, and stuff like that. And so I faxed it. Well, I didn't hear nothing back again for a couple months. And I called in, they said, we're reviewing it. We received it, but we were reviewing it. Well, now they say they haven't received it at all. And it's been a ye- over, I had the account of four months, like four or five months when I lost the card. It's been over a year now that I haven't had the card. They've built me everything that's on the account. It's almost two grand now. And it's a yearly fee and monthly fees. And that's are all that's on there. And they're telling me I owe this. Are you getting the monthly statements at all? Because they don't they never changed my address to my new address, but they have it. When I call I spoke to them this evening that when they called, they have my new address, but they're using my previous address. So the, your monthly statements are going to your previous address, and they know that? Yes. And do you have an online portal where you can log into? Yes. That might be our that, – that might be the problem. So the law says if – you are receiving regular statements and regular notification of what you owe and you have a dispute with them about something else you still have to pay it so if and the problem is if you have the ability to log in online monthly to see your account and see what your minimum payment due is you have to pay that now that's just the general rule if because you haven't had the card if it's a little complicated, Dominic, and, and, and we might need a little bit more time on that because there's some nuanced rules here. Generally speaking, just because they haven't sent you a card doesn't mean you can stop paying them what you've had spent on a card in the past. As long as they give you either regular st- – Dominic, you're on mute, so I know you're trying to respond. But um, you know, the rule is you have to pay what you've used, You know, so your past purchases, your past services – as long as you have the ability to see what your monthly amounts are, the, the monthly interest charge and how much your minimum payment is. So if you have an online access, but you're not getting statements, unfortunately, the court's going to say, sorry, Dominic, you should have kept paying. Now, if there are charges that shouldn't be there, if, if you lost the card and there are other charges that you don't recognize, that's a completely different story. But even if you lose the card, as long as you have access to an online account, you still have to pay for all your past purchases. Um, and you having paid it down to zero, what 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 are they what are they char- asking you to pay now? I guess I'm a little confused then. A monthly fee and an annual fee. Got it. Okay. That's all the charges that are on the card. That's it. Just monthly and annual fee. Okay, perfect. I can help you then. Yeah, contact Mike and, and Dave offline, and then they'll connect you to me. I can help with that for sure. Man, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's different. Now, if you don't have access Thanks to so the much. card, you can't enjoy the benefits of it. And you don't – yeah, they can't keep just keep charging you a monthly and a yearly fee, and they're not giving you access to the card because they, they have your address. I, I can help with that for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. All it. right, Dominique. Uh, you got our information, Dominique. Uh, just reach back out I and we'll set you up. All right, thank you guys All so right. much. All right, thank you. All right. Hey, Mike, hey, Mike, I think what we might have to do is break these down into like groups of 10 and, and maybe, uh, you know, might even have to charge for it or something. But there's no way with 200 plus people we can get all these questions. That was that hour went so quickly. Uh, yeah, I was kind of worried because we didn't answer nearly half the questions that's in the chat yeah not even close but you know let, let's do this again real soon um anyone with questions can obviously submit them to mike and dave you can compile a list the ones that you know because you you know what what can be cases from our program um mm-hmm. yeah you guys can be a well, good we have your questions up. um if you got my email or instagram we'll be able to respond and um i'll be able to ask his team if this is the case or not, and then we'll be able to see if we can assist you. Ooh, man. 
That was awesome. I had such a good time. And thank you so much, Aaron. Um, I, I got know, you, boy. Like, <laughs> oh, uh, Aaron, uh, you know, 200 people came up. You weren't shy about your answers. And I'm so glad that people got to actually listen to a real lawyer talk about credit because um, you don't need a license to do credit repair in some states. So right. it's like the wild, wild west. And people can say any and everything. But um, it's very important that um, we got somebody who can give direction for us to get compensated. That's I right. got you, Rosemary, too. That's right. Excellent. All right, guys. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. We're going to do this again. Don't worry, everyone. Appreciate you. <laughs> All right. All right, Aaron. Hey, Rosemary, uh, the one I ask your questions offline, so don't, don't worry. I'll give you your answers. All right. Woo! Hey, man. That had me hot. I was like, man, I want, but I really wanted to ask them those TikTok questions. No, we, we, we can save it for next time about these, uh, you know, the questions that we want to ask. But Oh, hold on. Before y'all go. Me, I asked your question offline. Uh, the way that I had asked your question offline um, to him. So, Hey, in the chat, let us know if y'all want him to come back because we can get him to come back next month if y'all want us to. Just say, uh, drop a... Bring drop him a, back. Put bring him back in the chat. And uh, what we're going to try to do is if you guys reach out to us on Instagram, we can try to get y'all on here so y'all can get y'all call answered. Um, some people, I DM um, the, the, the ability to join us on, but I didn't get a response from. So mm -hmm. I would love to hear from you guys. And uh, man, thank y'all for showing up and showing out, man, because he was nervous. He was like, how many people going to show up? I was like, I don't know, about 20, 30. But it's like 200 on here. That's dope.